now that you've played Nightwing in Harley Quinn, another DC character, how does your character in Blue Beetle differ from Nightwing? Well, I think for Nightwing, obviously, uh, different approach, different. Uh, Nightwing is brooding and um, and has a lot of uh, things that he's dealing with, and so does the character in Blue Beetle, but in, for different reasons. <laughs> How's it going? Good, mate. Sorry about the technical difficulties and drop. Wasn't it just so much easier we could just do this face to face? Yeah, and I was just like, uh, you think you get it right after two years? I'd be like, yeah, it's easy. It's it's not. I mean, I want to agree with you, but I, I you're right. It is easy. I just want to rub it in your face there. It's so easy to do this. <laughs> Thanks. That's a, that's a, the best way to start this. Is to <laughs> acknowledge my show. Yeah, if I could just really rub in that you're rubbish with technology, move on. <laughs> it can only go up from here. Oh no, don't worry, you've not seen my interviews. They could get a lot worse. <laughs> Whereabouts in the uh, the world are you? I'm in LA right now. I was speaking to your publicist and she's like, oh, he's flying from here to here to here. And I felt so, I felt knackered reading the emails for you. I was so <laughs> tired just thinking where you're going in the world. Yeah, it's been a crazy... Oh my gosh, it's only the third week of the month. <laughs> I was gonna say, it's been a crazy year. I was like, wait, it's only been three weeks. Uh, yeah, in the last four weeks, I've been in New York three times, and then I was in Europe, I was in Spain, and then I was supposed to go to London, and then I had to come back for the Golden Globe, so there you go. Hey, what was you gonna come to London for? I was gonna see Kayvon. I was gonna go visit him, and uh, and just on holiday. And so uh, it was a uh, last minute change, and I, he was like, yeah, man, don't worry. Just like, yeah, he said, like, go, go have fun. And then I'll see you, you know, in the summer or something. I mean, to be fair, the Golden Globes is a very, very good excuse. It's a good excuse. Yeah, it's a pretty good excuse. Yeah. Speaking of that, dude, congratulations. You're you're in an Oscar nominated movie now. That's insane. I think uh, that's the first time I've heard it out loud. <laughs> I think I heard it in my head. And then it was just the voices, you know, but now it's uh, it makes it real. <laughs> don't get too excited because I've got a little uh, replica. And I, I don't know if this is an exact one-to-one -one model, but this was about five quid off Amazon and it's cheap and nasty and hollow. Yeah, no, I think it might be a little different. It looks a little, it looks a little smaller than I remember seeing them, yeah. Right, okay, because yeah, this has got quite a few chips on it here and here. Yeah. I didn't want you to get your hopes up if you do win it and go, oh, it's just like that. It's a different company. I think that's a different company. You know, they switch it out, so it's fine, yeah. Right, have I been duped by Amazon? That's annoying. I don't, I don't know. No, the good people at Amazon would not. <laughs> <laughs> just in case they want to sponsor this video. Thank you for saving me there. <laughs> exactly yeah it's so weird to come across with those all the time i always see them like on shelves or like i was filming something uh at a home and they had one as like a bookshelf and i was like what on, on the bookshelf and i was just like what is this and i was like is this a real oscar and they were like a documentary maker and they're like oh yeah i won for and i totally forgot the documentary it was for and i was like what and i was like you just have an oscar <laughs> like like <laughs> Yeah, I always think that because like I'd want to put it like in a Mission Impossible style like booth with lasers around me. Or was it a regular film? I think it must have been a film, but it was like from the 80s. And I don't even remember. The, I didn't even bother to ask. I was just so taken back of like, you just put it here like on the It's like, yeah, you know, it's just like there it is. And I was like, I wonder where all the Oscars are right now. Where are they just like eventually we're just going to see Oscars like, you know, <laughs> in someone's like coffee table. And it's just like, oh, yeah, I just put it there next to the mat and it's like. Yeah, so I don't know. Where would I put my Oscar if I had an Oscar? <laughs> I'd, I'd wear it like, I'd have it as a necklace. So it's on me at all times. Yeah, like a Mr. T necklace, right? With an Oscar. Well, one of my mates rented an Airbnb and it was just an Airbnb. Turns out when he got there, it belonged to an Oscar winner. And like, he was just in there with an Oscar. And the I'm... Oscar was in the Airbnb? In was in the Airbnb. In, in photos and like, I'd have that as my Tinder picture. Like, it would be everything. <laughs> I just have the Oscar as my Tinder picture, just the Oscar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right. That more more swipeable than this, to be fair. And then and then I get reported and be like, that's not really Oscar. <laughs> you don't look like your profile picture. You don't look like your profile. And it's like I no, that's me. That's definitely me. <laughs> as you're coming in spray painted gold like that. Yeah. <laughs> I saw a very sleepy version of you at 6am on your Instagram after you've just been 
announced to be in a, an Academy Award nominated movie. Hey guys, uh, I was just woken up. It's like 6 a.m. And I was woken up with the news that uh, we're nominated for an Oscar. Talk me through it because at 6 a.m., blinking hurts for me. So, like, did you manage to celebrate at six or were you like, right, okay, I have to shower, I have to eat, and then we can pop the champagne? Yeah, no, I don't, I don't even think I had champagne all day. I just, uh, I woke up, uh, you know, uh, my friend and publicist court, she texts me and she woke me up and I thought it was an emergency because I was like, I was, you know, I was in the tween of like, it's, or it's morning already and it's like, 6 a.m. so you're not uh, awake but you're like not in the REM like not deep in the REM you're like waking up and so I was like I heard something and I was like what is that and then I looked over and then I looked at it and it was like my vision was like blurry I was like what what's going on and then it's just like what and then it just said uh yay and I was like what <laughs> is this puss in boots and, and then I think she was so excited she typed it wrong so she corrected it again so I was like it was like uh puts uh l boots puts l boots or something like that. <laughs> and then i put my boots put the boots <laughs> and i was like why what's the emergency and it's like correction put some boots nominated and i was like oh my gosh and the, that really woke me up and and i wasn't really quite awake though i i'm glad that i had my phone on me because i literally just turned on the light and i was like my hair was all messed up and just like wanted to remember that moment and it was really kind of surreal just because I'm glad that I forgot that it was that morning because I literally probably wouldn't have gone to bed. I probably just would have been like, I'm gonna stay up and see if it happens. And if it doesn't happen, you know, we'll see. But I'm glad that I did it. And that was actually the best way to wake up was uh, to have somebody else kind of jolt you. It was like, yeah, you got nominated. You know, and the film that you're in, it's like nominated for an Oscar. That's crazy. I was just talking to your publicist beforehand. When I tell you, I cried through that. I nearly dehydrated from the eyes during it. And I thought, it's a Puss in Boots movie. What's gonna get me? I like from the beginning I was sobbing it's just such a gorgeous gorgeous movie an amazing movie the animation the performance it's so good but you have got some tough competition in this category bud like including Guillermo del Toro's Pinocchio that's right and I'm thinking if it does win you've got a good chance of guilt tripping him into just handing you his Oscar because you can be like look I based Guillermo de la Cruz on you so give me your Oscar. Yeah, and I think that's what it's gonna be, you know, it might come down to that, you know, and uh, hopefully it doesn't, and hopefully we walk away with an Oscar, and you know, that's great. But really though, like, it's like, you know, uh, now meeting Guillermo and like him, um, just even aware of like, you know, of the work that we do and stuff. And he actually loves the film as well, you know? So it's kind of like, uh, it's always great when like artists support artists, just like, because yes, it's at the end of the day, like the accolades and the awards and those are fantastic and they're great. But it's also really nice to when you hear like an artist that you admire, who's also in the very, you know, uh, category being nominated as well. Uh, and just them to say that they really enjoyed, you know, the work that you did or really enjoyed that project and, um, and vice versa, you know, like I think, um, I saw Pinocchio and it was beautiful, you know, just like uh, stop motion is really great and um, it's really time consuming. I just, you know, recently uh, did a stop motion project that took like two years to make because it just, uh, it's so time consuming, but the final product is so beautiful. Uh, and with Puss in Boots, like you said, the story is so great that I think that they're just different, you know, stop motion and a classic like Pinocchio, you know, and then uh, Puss in Boots. Uh, with an original script and with a new angle and like you said people didn't expect to go to the theater and cry but we introduced something really dark and um, it's just you know like death is introduced into Puss in Boots and when you think of like an animation you don't think of that being like one of the storylines but uh, we keep forgetting that animation is not uh, just for children you know animations for all of us and it's something that we can all enjoy and the fact that parents could take their kids and the kids loved it because it was so fun and um, enjoyable and then the parents left i had like a, a mom tell me i left that theater and i hugged my my kids a little bit tighter that day i kissed my husband a little bit harder that day and it was just like because at the end of the day that was the moral of the story was that we only have this one life and, and that's all we get and so it's uh, live it up and, and worth every second and live it to the fullest and people really walked away with that message it's like you know some things are inevitable and we keep uh, going through life with the fear of the inevitable and we're not really enjoying life and i really love that message about puss in boots is that we walk away and 
we're just uh happy to be alive you know <laughs> that's the thing i i because my girlfriend was away at her dad's uh, my fiance sorry should call her my fiance oh sorry you're in trouble yeah <laughs> Whew. I'll edit that out. It'll be seamless. She'll never know. I'll let her know that you edited it out. Don't worry. <laughs> but she was at her dad's and I was I was watching it and uh, yeah, and I remember texting her and I, I was like, I was crying and I was like, oh God, you're right. I do only have this one life. I just want to squeeze her little head to like, and because of Puss in Boots, I'm, I'm going to cry again now. I'm going to move swiftly <laughs> on before I do just spend the next 30 minutes crying in front of you. It's really great. It's really great message. The writers did an amazing job. The directors were fantastic. And we got to do something, um, you know, when you sign on to do this, like what I did, I was like, it was just an honor to be asked, like to even audition for it. And I was joining like the, the ranks of Salma Hayek and Antonio Banderas, who, you know, I grew up um, idolizing them because as a Latino, you really didn't see yourself represented a lot. And you made history with having three leads in an animated uh you know feature the latinos you know so it's just like kind of really great to to be a part of that and to to be a part of something so special that means so much to so many people so obviously with the oscars is this going to be your first time attending the oscars this is my first time attending the oscars and uh and i'm glad that i didn't like you know some people they do projects and they're like oh like he's gonna get oscar buzz and it's gonna be the best thing ever. and i'm glad that i didn't do that with uh with this project just because I was really proud of it and I was like, you never know, you know? And, uh, and so every nomination kind of like got us closer and closer and it was like the BAFTAs and, you know, and like, you know, Golden Globes and Critics' Choice and you gain these nominations and we're like, oh, I was like, oh, people are like, oh, people are, they're really like, they, you like me, you really like me. And Sally feels that in her Oscar speech. Um, but just uh, the idea that we even got here, it, then looking back and seeing all the response that the, the audience has had and how we're excited for it to premiere in the UK. And um, people are so antsy about it. Like uh, people on Twitter, like, when is it getting to the UK now? You know, and like, they want to see it so bad because they hear word of mouth and they see clips and um, the anticipation is like killing them. And I, and I, part of me is like, I wish I could just, everyone could see it at the same time. And I don't know how that works, but it doesn't. And, uh, but it's about to, you know, take over the UK. So I'm really excited to hear what everyone in the UK is uh, thinking. So if this is your first time at the Oscars, you must have like, a bucket list of things you want to do because if i was in your position i'd be like i want to slip michelle yo my number in her goodie bag i, I, I want to send it <laughs> to like brendan gleason at the urinals it was like all your favorite tv actors and all your favorite film actors in the same room like at the same party and you're like this is crazy and then now the oscars it's like you know the cream of the crop and just like um so i'm excited to just to be in the room where it happens uh hamilton <laughs> broadway mate i've also been just loving your little romance with selma hayek like seeing you two present an actual award at the golden globes that must have been a pinch me moment I, I was speaking to margot robbie the other day and she was telling me at the golden globes like she was challenging other tables to like see who can down the most tequilas against her was was your night as mad as that i it was it was so crazy just to be presenting with salma and uh, and you know she she's been doing this you know for a while and like she's such a pro but it's also funny because even at the pro level she still gets those butterflies which is really nice and endearing to see like you know we were backstage and like she you know she's a, she's great at everything she does and and she just wants to have it right you know and so she was backstage she's like she's like i had to be so why did i do to do this every time i do this i get the butterflies in my stomach and i was just like good that's good and she's like i i need my tequila and she's like literally we need so we took a shot of tequila like before and uh, she has a tr she has like a tradition like that's what she does she's like she's oh no i always do the same you know and uh, she let me in on that tradition and i was so glad because i was just like this is so cool like we're presenting together uh we have this tradition now uh it's just uh it's just really great and she's been so supportive and wonderful and from the second i met her she's been like uh you know a ball of light and positivity it's great that i've spoken to two people about the golden globes and both stories have involved tequila and margo was right next to us too her table was right next to us so i saw her um you know and yeah it's just it's just crazy to see like you know margo robbie sitting there i was at the table with viola davis and salma hayek like at my table like i was just like what is happening and viola and uh her husband were so kind and um they just gave me the sweetest message that they were like 
we're watching what you're doing and it's fantastic and we can't wait for the rest like you know the next project that you know i was like what is happening like it's just um it was just very nice and very um humbling and um it was just it, it was just a great night and i'm just i'm just excited for award season just because it's so every time you go to award show you have a memory like you know it's no two award shows are the same and especially you know going to the oscars like it's just um yeah i feel like that's gonna be the cherry on top i'm living vicariously through you now like i was like oh my god viola davis <laughs> said that to me in a way i feel yeah yeah it, she did she told yeah. me to tell you <laughs> it was yeah it was true daniel <laughs> so look, right let's chat puss in boots the last wish because i know you like to accept characters that you know you can somehow relate to how, like how how do you relate to this little bug-eyed dog that lives in a sock and he's abandoned by his family where's your mutual ground there i mean for me <clears throat> i like to take roles that are different than other roles that i take so i don't get in a routine of playing like the same thing and then with perrito um i mean his voice is like an octave higher than mine so it was finding that voice for him and that pitch and giving him like just the slightest bit of uh, an accent where he's not from anywhere specific, but he is from somewhere. And like, because that's what he is, right? He's a traveling, like, you know, for lack of a better word, he's a mutt, you know, he's just like, goes from one town to the next and he has all these adventures, but he, he's full of life and full of positivity. And I think that uh, subconsciously, I like to think that I kind of carry myself that way. And uh, my sister, my wonderful sister just made a post about um, you know, uh, recently, like, uh, she's been dealing with, like, some health issues and whatnot, and um, on the day that I got the nomination, I, I sent her this bouquet of flowers, and she goes, how are you sending me flowers on the day that you're nominated for an Academy Award? And because um, I try to, like, be the, the positive person in this scenario, because that's what you would want in, in a bad scenario. So if I was in a bad situation, you want the people around you to be in a positive um, mindset. And so I try to keep myself in a positive mindset, because if I'm if I can do it, why wouldn't I? So if I'm being a positive mindset and it helps you have a good day or it helps you through your tough time, why wouldn't you? Because there's gonna come a time when you might be in a in a slum and you know, might be in a in a bad place in a dark spot and need the positivity around you to lift you. So I think with Perrito, I kind of use that as, you know, he has a horrible backstory. <laughs> like you know, the joke of been putting him in a sock, throwing him in a river with rocks. Uh, and the joke's on them because I, you know, I like, I, I won the game and I got this cool sweater, like stuff like that, where like you choose to see the glass half full as opposed to half empty. And um, I think I've always done that. So that part wasn't too hard and stretched for me. It was the creating the voice. It was more of a challenge uh, because I would go home exhausted. Like I was like, that voice is a higher pitch. And I'm just like, woo, that's a workout. Um, but yeah, I think that I, I like to think of myself as a bit of perrito, so. <laughs> Well, I was just going to say, like, you, well, as you said, you must have been exhausted because not only have you got to be upbeat, you've got to be energetic and optimistic the whole time, but I bet you must have put a huge physical performance into doing it as well. Like, you must have been really going for it. Yeah, there was, like, I think there's footage of me, like, going in one part where I'm trying to do the cute face, and it's just, like, strain. So it's already his voice already knocked it higher, but then when he's actually going higher and straining his voice, I was like, mm, you know, it's like going higher. So my full body was, like, engaged, and I remember, like, I mean, I got like, you know, warm and like, I was like breaking a sweat. Cause I was like, whoa, it's like a workout. Cause you really, all you have to do, uh, you know, all you can do in a voiceover or an animated feature is that you can use your voice as your storyteller. And like, that's it. Like you can just tell a story with your voice. You don't, you can't rely on your body. Although your body is making different movements to get that sound out of you. But like at the end of the day, no one knows what you're doing behind the microphone because they can't see you. And so uh, it is a workout and like to get those sounds and to make sure that it feels that you're in emotion and action and yelling and distance. Like you really have to put yourself in that position as that's in that scene with Perrito and then just do it. There's no like, you know, people think they go to recording screen, you're like, ah, watch out. No help help you know it's just like it's not like just saying your voice and like you could do that i feel like if you want to but for me i can't i can't do it that way for me i have to like full out do it so it feels and that's why i feel like it, it, it comes across that way in the film it feels like this feels like a like a real character these characters feel like they could you know they are doing living their life like this i'm gonna warn you now you doing that is probably gonna be my youtube thumbnail because it was the most pure <laughs> thing i've ever seen in my whole life <laughs> Yeah, I just walk around doing this to people. Like, yeah. Or when you were straining. I mean, when you was like yeah. that, again, <laughs> quite a nice thumbnail. <laughs>
you're speaking about the voice there, it must be a bit of a pinch me moment because I, I like, aren't you and Antonio not only the English voice actors, but don't you do the Latin American release voice as well? We did, yeah, and uh, and I think uh, that's rarely done. Like that's usually not the case. Uh, and so another one, you know, for the books that I was like, I asked if I could do it, and they're like, Oh, are you sure? Because we usually have like someone just dub and like. I was like, No, I feel like I owe it to myself and 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 being you know Mexican American to my culture. I was just like, If I can do it, and I speak the language, I should try to do it. You know, uh, which proved out to be great and almost a challenge in itself because, you know, some of the words have to be translated into like um, kind of dialect that you would use like in Latin America and whatnot. And so you have to match the lips and what we already have kind of in a way. So I was like, oh, when that word translates, it translates to like a 30 letter word or something when in English it's just like three, you know? And it's just like, ooh, we're gonna try to squish like, you know, it, like 30 syllables in this <laughs> one line. Uh, but uh, it came out so great and I've been getting messages from people from, you know, Mexico and South America and just like, oh my gosh, and Harvey did it. And like they do it both in English and Spanish when they respond to me. So it's really lovely and I'm glad I did it. I'm really glad because actually I was really proud to show that to my mom because I'm Spanish speaking and she uh, loves the projects I do. But for the most part, it'll be like in subtitles or something. And uh, this one, she could literally go watch and, and understand everything and, and love it. And so I, I was doing it more for like my mom. <laughs> oh, well, plus you also now get to show off your bilingual swearing skills as well, which is probably a bonus. Which is an art and people don't understand that uh, that should be your first line on your resume, you know, can swear in two languages. With your, your Oscar profile picture on Tinder, make sure that's also the opening line in there. I can swear in loads of languages. Oh yeah, I'm gonna be busy. I'm gonna be pretty busy. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and uh, yeah, I'm booked. <laughs> so you're the fourth character in the Shrek franchise that curses, but you're the first one who's actually had to be censored because it's so brutal and vulgar. Like, were your swears written down in the script or did Joel just go, go on, get freaky with it? I mean, there was like, uh, there was like some that were like, you know, it's like, like a starting point. Uh, and then I think we we're in the booth we did like a take where it was like me swearing for like a good probably three, four minutes straight, which would never make it in the film. <laughs> but it was just letting me riff and like let it, and then and then picking the ones that, you know, went with the scene and, and it was perfect. Because even now when they do bleep, I don't know what word that was. <laughs> Cause I was like, what did I say there? Because I was, there was so many. Like there was so many, I think at one point it was just like every other word was like beep, 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 beep. You know, it was just like being in a traffic jam and just like someone hung. <laughs> it was just, uh, it was really fun to do. And I think that was um, one of the really fun days on set where it was just like the, the directors were just laughing like behind the booth and like, uh, and it was like, do we do it again? And they're like, I think we got it <laughs> or something like that. Legally, we cannot do it again. <laughs> Legally, they won't let us, yeah. <laughs> Surely you must have felt a little bit guilty or like just a little bit dirty knowing your swear words are coming out of poor little Perito's innocent, adorable mouth. Yeah, I feel like it's, it's funny because, you know, by that point, we kind of like are on, on his side, you know? And I feel like it's kind of great because he's not doing it at all to be malicious. He's not doing it to be cruel. He wants to literally belong. Like he literally wants to be a part of what this is with the bears and the bears are going back and forth. And they're like, and they welcome, like in a way they're like, you shut your mouth or I'll cut you from, you know, pooter scooter or whatever. And then he's like, all right, I'm in the mix now. You know, the idea that he feels that he's like, I get to join. Okay, here's what I got. It might not be good, but beep, 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 you know, just like, and they're like, oh my God, that's that very bad. But he never did it with any ill intention. Like he's not malicious. And even at the end, after he does all that, he stops and he's laughing at his own joke because he feels so uh, a part of something and feels like uh, it's inclusive. And he's like, and he tells, you know, a Goldie, you hit the orphan jackpot, you know? Like, this is cool. Like you have someone you can riff off and a family who lets you kind of like, you know, and that's what family does, you know? You make fun of each other, you poke at each other, uh, you get into fights sometimes, but you love each other. Like that's what makes a family and he longs for that. What everyone else takes for granted every day, like this poor dog would kill to yell profanities at someone every day. Stop it, this is meant to be a question about a cartoon dog swearing and now I'm this close to crying again. How have you <laughs> blipped it onto me like that? <laughs> 
mean, it happens. <laughs> Obviously, we're going to do the natural progression from swearing to the birth of a little baby. I want to say congratulations to, to you and your brother and his partner who just brought a little baby into the world. No, oh, yeah, it's, uh, I'm so excited. Uh, they asked me to be the godfather and I literally was like, oh my gosh, this is my baby now. Like I'm taking the baby home. Uh, and they're like, no, that's not how that works. Uh, I was like, no, I'm pretty sure. Like godfather and it's like, and there's gonna be a movie about me. And then yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, I just, uh, it's really nice to see uh, my brother and Brittany, his, his partner, so happy and just welcoming this new life into the world. And yeah, I just like, and it's funny cause they, they just got back home for me in the hospital and she sent me a video and it was the baby uh, being like, you know, uh, burped while the baby's eyes are looking over his shoulder and they're watching Mickey Mouse Funhouse, which is like a, a cartoon that I do, <laughs> in which I voice the, the voice of funny. And they're like, uh, baby watching Nino on screen. <laughs> oh, you must be the best godfather because the amount of Perito merch you must have that you can just go, and now that's for you. Yeah, yeah, no, I think, uh, I think, yeah, I, I'm the, I, I think I'm the best uncle. I'm gonna be the best godfather thing because I, I, I love kids. It's just like I'm always working and busy, but like when I'm there, I'm like, what do you want? And like they get the world, you know, like took my niece to like Disneyland and whatever she wanted and just like, I want to be the cool uncle and now the the cool godfather who does a really good job. And then like, you know, they, they go back to mom and dad at the end. <laughs> Do you want to be my uncle? Cause I'd love to go Disneyland. Yeah, <laughs> I've gotten that uh, a lot. People have asked me to be their uncle. Just, uh, yeah, I just, uh, I think it's so great. And just like, and I have now two nieces a Scarlett and you know, a new baby uh, born one. So I think, yeah, and I'm gonna spoil them. I just know I am. So like, it's just like, like they already know, like that. That don't try to stop me. Like it's <laughs> it's gonna happen. I'm gonna spoil them. So like, please don't try to stop me. <laughs> I think it's only fair that we continue now your little uh, Perito journey. DreamWorks have made loads and loads of different spin-offs. Would you like to see Perito get his own like spin-off series? Maybe. What would you like to see happen in it? I mean, yeah, that'd be cool. I mean, I'd be open to that. It's funny because, you know, Puss in Boots was a spinoff from Shrek. And so if anything, it just goes to show this, the Shrek universe has uh, provided, you know, an abundance of like possibilities. And like, um, it's just great to be a part of the Shrek world. And now with Puss in Boots, and if that were to happen, then I would gladly welcome it. And I could definitely see it, you know, Perito definitely has stories. I want to know where he got that scar on his stomach. Like when he raises his shirt, like I was like, where did that scar come from? There's a story there, you know? And I feel that um, that's just so great about this universe that it chooses characters that could easily be like, that could be a story, you know, we, where did that come from? Where are they going? And we, at the end of Puss in Boots, The Last Wish, we do see them headed towards uh, a familiar land. Uh, so, you know, anything's possible. <laughs> Well, if Shrek were to ever meet Perito, who do you think he'd be more annoyed by, Perito or Donkey? I mean, I think at this point, Shrek has become such good friends with Donkey that you start tolerating your friends' like little quirks and stuff, and they become part of your relationship. So I think he'd be annoyed with Perito for <laughs> the beginning. And I get to the point where like Perito would probably annoy him and Donkey, and Donkey would probably be something like, I never met anyone so annoying like you in my life, you know, or something like that. You know, it's just like, I could see like, uh, you know, Perrito being so annoying that like, they're both at the same, we both agree on this, you know? I know, I know you've just essentially written the spin off there, but can I just get a producer credit? It's entirely a vanity title, but I feel like yeah, I yeah, helped yeah. a little bit. Yeah, yeah, I think that's doable. Yeah. And also, yeah, that's what a good uncle would do, would help you get. <laughs> You're the best uncle I've ever had. And that's, <laughs> that's a real kick in the teeth to my actual <laughs> uncle there. I'm so sorry to him. <laughs> If I were you, I would be taking everyone I knew to see Puss in Boots. I take like my Uber drivers to see. I take like people who work like serve me in shops. And I know there's one person that you took that's quite close to you. I know that um, your master Nandor uh, <laughs> saw it. What did he make of it? Well, that's so, the funny part about that is that we were shooting something in a building next to a theater and we we're shooting Shadow season five. And um, it was early on in the fall and it was a poster. It was, I think it was one of the first posters I saw. And this was in Canada, by the way. It wasn't like in America or it was in North America, but it was in Canada, a uh, different country. And we were shooting in Toronto 
and I, it was the first poster I saw for the project. And I was with them and we were shooting a scene next door and we're walking out to our trailer. And I, and I looked and I was like, oh, I was like, oh my gosh. And then everyone's like, hey, isn't that your, and it was like, that was the first time I saw it. And it was in a movie uh, poster holding, you know, outside the theater. And it said, coming soon. It didn't even have like a date. It was just like coming soon. It was like pretty, like probably like six months before it came out or something. Um, or maybe not that long, maybe it was three months, three months, but it was like coming soon. And I was just like, we took a picture with it. And so I remember I saved it and, and I kept it until like the, you know, the premiere week. And I was like, we're going to see prison boots finally. <laughs> I bet you felt like such a big name on campus on that set that day. I mean, it's so crazy. Cause you know, you work with your shadows family in the, you know, we're on season five already. And we're starting season six later this year. Uh, and they become like your family. So they're really supportive and like wonderful. Like um, our DP like messaged me yesterday and was like, congratulations on Academy Awards, it's a huge deal. And like our director, Yana Gorskaya, you know, um, so supportive. It's just like, yeah, they, they love seeing like, when, it's like when they have a good kid and the kid goes and does like a talent show or has like a volleyball tournament and they come back with like a flyer for it. Like, that's great. We're going to go see that volleyball tournament. You know. <laughs> See, that's the thing, like hearing you talk about that, I'm like, I love my mates with all my heart, but I would bin them in a, in a second just to be a part of the what we do in the shadows little friendship group. I'd yeah. love to know <laughs> what goes on in what we do in the shadows WhatsApp group. I mean, mostly, I think that the chat's mostly Kayvon and I. Like, I feel like Kayvon and I have become so close and because we shoot so much and most of our scenes are together, uh, we just became so close and we have this a similar sense of humor. Uh, and so it's just, it's so dangerous. Like everyone loves us on set. And also like, once you get us going, like we can't stop. Like, it's just like, especially Kayvon. I mean, he's the funniest person I know. Like he's just, you know, so wonderful, like to work with. Like th that guy, it, you could be working 16 hour days and like, you're not having a bad day on set, you know? And it's just like, and he can always tell if like someone else having a bad day or, you know, um, or someone's like, if you got like a cold or something, or you're sick. And I remember season one, I was like, I had like a season finale uh, scene where we had to do stunts. And I was coming down with like the flu or something. I remember it was season one. And I remember like, I had like 104 fever or something like that. And uh, I mean, now we would never go to set. Like, absolutely not. This was like pre COVID. Uh, but like, it was, uh, it was, it was crazy. Cause like, it was the last day of shooting. And then we stopped production. And obviously we had to do it again. But he was like, oh man, I don't like you like this. I don't like, I don't like when you're, cause my energy was so low. And I was like, I'm saving my energy, blah, blah, We got it, it was done, it was great, it looked fantastic. But he can tell when you're not like at your like top. Like he's like, he's just like, oh man, I don't like you like this. I don't like you like, you know? So you're not, you're not an actor, you're my best friend. <laughs> <laughs> so there's like moments like that where, you know, you want your family to be so supportive and stuff and, um, it was just uh it's just working on the show has just been like a dream come true and the and the writers like sarah naftales so since season one i was just like you know amazing and writes such great stuff for guillermo so do the other writers um and then paul and everyone is just uh you know fantastic and it was just like it's so great to go to work with a group of people who are so funny already in the script the way it's written and they let you like play they let you like improvise which is unheard of and so it's like it's the best of both worlds and but yeah um, I feel like I went on a rant. To answer your question, my favorite color is blue. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I mean, you mentioned the uh, the improv there. I mean, uh, kudos to all of you guys in that because it's so seamless. Do you remember the first time you were riffing with the guys? Like, did you ever feel like, oh my god, like I'm so out of my depth here? No, because I remember shooting the pilot with everyone, and I remember the pilot. Um, it was just like, I, I always say it's like playing hot potato. Like it was just like playing hot potato and no one drops it. Like it's like, this cast is so good at what they do and they're so good at their characters that in season one, there was a take that we improvised. Um, like it was like a who's on first, like it was in the in the fancy room and like people, like Nando was like looking for me. It was like, Guillermo. And I was like, I'm in the, I'm in the room. I'm in the room too. It was like, no, the other room. And he comes in from the door and I exit the other door and he comes in and says, this, fucking guy you know like leaves and then lasso comes in so like nando and it's just like i'm in the room and so like i'm in the room and he's like Ugh. and he leaves and then natasha comes in with her and everyone was like it was like a benny hill sketch like, you know and it ran for like 20 minutes 
never were able to use any of that footage. They ended up using like maybe 20 seconds of the footage because it wouldn't make sense. It was like, it was an ongoing bit. If we were doing a stage production, funny for 20 minutes, you know? But unfortunately we're doing TV and we're doing like, a, you know, like a 20 minute show you know, <laughs> after commercials. So we didn't have the time for that, but that's what I mean that we could keep riffing. And we, and we learned early on that that was the curse and the blessing. Cause it's like, we could, we could just riff for hours and we would never end up using any of the footage, but or we could riff for like short periods of times and just make it gold. And I think we perfected it now where we know uh, how far something can go and riff until it gets there. And then everyone agrees. Do you think we got it? We got it. 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 Yeah. And we always have what's called a funsy run, which is like we do a scripted version and the director says, I think we got the scripted version because we'll do a couple of takes like that. And then we call it, uh, and I think I, I, it was actually me who coined this. I said, can we do like a fun run? at the? Because at the end, we, in the first season, I think it was Taika was directing. He said, let's do one, an improv run or imp call it improv. And I was like, ooh, funsies. I said funsies. And he's like, yeah, it's a funsy run. Let's do a funsy run. And he's like, yeah, funsies. And I was like, from there on, it was called funsies. Like everyone was just like, so I said, ooh, a fun run. You know, it's like, ooh, funsies. And then it became known as, this is the funsies. Okay, guys, we got it. This is the funsies. <laughs> well, if you want, I know you said like you do 20 minute takes of improv and you know, you have to condense it to like 20 seconds. If you want, cast me in the next season because I will kill the improv in a heartbeat. I'll, I'll just go, <laughs> oh yeah, you stink. And they'll go, yeah, no, we'll probably just end it there. I'll, I'll bring it up to the writers and see what they think. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll bring it up. Yeah. And I'm only doing it for you guys, just to make it a bit more time efficient, not for my own cynical levels of fame that I want to achieve. No, no, no. It's clearly just to help out the the show, you know. And uh, I'll bring it up. Don't worry. I'll just definitely. I'll see if it. I'll see if we can do a funsies about it. <laughs> I'm I'm actually a little bit annoyed with you because not only are you good at improv, but you're you're such a little badass when it comes to stunts and fight choreography as well. <laughs> oh my, was there ever like a moment or like a sequence where you're like, no, I'm a human being. I cannot physically do that. What are you thinking? No, I think the danger with me is that I say yes to all the stunt stuff. And then I look back and I see the stuff like, what was I fucking thinking? Like, it's like, there was one scene in season two where they, at first, first of all, they were like, we're gonna get you stunt double and obviously they're gonna do all the stuff. <clears throat> but do you think you can do a little bit of it? Like, you know, when we started off, they were like, not sh no high hopes for me. Like they were, they were like, can you do this? And it was like a punch. And I was like, yeah, I could do that. It was basically asking, can you walk and chew gum at the same time? That's what they were asking. And I was like, wait, are you asking if I can do the basic minimum? And they're like, yeah. And they're like, so they kept testing me and they kept throwing curveballs at me. And they're like, what about this? What about that? What about this? And then before you knew it, they're like, I remember uh, Tig, our stunt uh, coordinator and director, he was like, he went to the producers, like Harvey is actually like a natural stunt person. And they're like, no, what do you mean? And it's like, like, I would, I would hire him as a stunt person to do stuff because he's really good in his feet. Cause I took years of dance and I, I see stunt as uh, like a ballet. And then you always have to step on the right beat or someone gets hurt, you know? So you have to be on the right count and the right beat at the right spot. And if you keep that, the dance is always beautiful and it's, uh, and it's, you know, effortless. And, but if you miss a step, someone can get really hurt, you know? And so for me, it's counts and I count with the beats and the big finale for uh, at the, vam at the vampire um, theater uh, was season two finale. And that one was a huge stunt, which is the one that I was like, like dying uh, in the last take. Uh, Cause yeah, I had like a fever. And it was just like, so that one, I remember working so hard on and it was like full, like it was all in one motion. It was no cuts. When you saw it in the show, they cut away to reactions of the vampires, which like made it seem like we might've cut. There was no cuts in between the take. Like it was like the nonstop. And I think I have some of that footage on my Twitter and stuff where I posted it. Cause people didn't think it was me for people automatically assume that it was not me and it was my stunt double. And I had to like convince people, I was like, it's me, why would I lie? And it's like, no, but like, that's not you, like that's your stunt double. I was like, look, it's my face. Like, yeah, but it's so quick, Harvey. Like they, I had to convince people that I did it. And so I, I started videoing the rehearsals. And so, cause people were still not believing that it was me. And because, you know, make people make assumptions They're like, oh, well, you're an actor. And also you're, you know, you're a person of size, you know? And like, I don't think that you would be, it's like, don't judge a book by its cover. And it's just like, so I really take pride in doing my own stunts. And there was one stunt that I looked back and I was like, wow, I can't believe I did that. Cause it was the one where I flip everyone off and I go out the window. So that was like a third story real window that falls into a giant cushion 
uh, air thing. And I looked back at that footage, I was like, I could have fallen wrong and like completely injured myself. But in the moment in Guillermo mode and it's a Van Helsing, like I can do anything. Like literally when I'm in Guillermo mode, I'm like, yes, I can do anything. And then look at the playback, I'm like, oh my God, what is, what is wrong with you? Why did you agree to this? Uh, and then I, you know, but I'm proud of myself for doing it and I continue to do it. And, uh, and really this season we'll have a little more stunt stuff coming up. So I'm really excited. There was one stunt that they didn't let me do because of insurance reasons. It was, um, you know, Josh, who's my amazing stunt double. Uh, he, uh, had to do it and he's so, I don't know, he's like, yeah, finally I get to go in. He was like making a joke out of it because he usually gets stressed as me and ready as me. And he just stands in the wings and he just like waits to see if I tap out. Uh, but he's all like, yeah. And uh, for this one, it was uh, when he falls on the staircase backwards over his head. Uh, when he falls down, they were like, and the stairs are so steep, like they're just so steep that they're like, there's no way. So let a professional do it. And then even when he did it, I was like, oh God, why are you doing this? Uh, but he's such a pro and he did it like in one take. And I was like, yeah, we got it. Uh, but it was, that was probably the most dangerous one. Um, this next one, next season, well, you can't tell you much about it. Yeah, you can go and treat yourself. Uh, it's, 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 uh, it's like a, a sequence of, of events. So I'll say that much. Uh, and there's a lot of movement. <laughs> you know what? If you tell me you can have this. What? The scratch up, <laughs> not actual size. <laughs> you've had some major guest stars in what we do in the shadow as well. Like you've had. Dave Bautista, Tilda Swinton, Nick Kroll, Mark Hamill, like so many amazing names. And I know even Lin-Manuel Miranda is like Guillermo's biggest fan. Like who who do you reckon is, you know, the biggest celebrity that's a fan of the show? Is, has anyone messaged you that's just blown your mind? Oh man, there's a lot of people who love the show, which always blows my mind. Um, but Lin-Manuel like introduces us, you know, at uh, the Emmys, our second season, and then give a shout out to Guillermo at the end. He said, you're like Guillermo, you know, uh, which is really great and love and I got to meet him in person since then. Um, so for me, being a musical theater kid, that's a big one. Uh, I was just like, that's huge and so great. Um, Mark Hamill was a fan of the show before he came on, his kids uh, introduced him to the show. And then we found out that he would be interested and we were like, we would be so lucky to have him. And he came onto the show. Um, everyone that comes to the show and guest stars is a fan of the show. You know, this season, again, I can't tell you who's guest starring, but the people who are guest starring uh, come to the set and they're like, I love this show. It's my favorite. I'm so happy you're having me. And it, it, it like, you know, it's, it, it runs from like uh, reality stars to Oscar winners, to Emmy award winners, to TV and film actors, to everything like it literally runs the gamut like it's just like it's it's everything and everyone and uh from all walks of life like they just like love the show and it's always curious i'm always curious to know how they found out about it or their story their origin of like how they became a, a shadows fan and it's always great to hear the story some people just discovered it like this year and they binged all seasons and now they can't wait now they're lucky they're happy that they waited this long because now they watch it all non-stop so but i think yeah it's always fun when you see like another actor or celebrity or director uh some people you know who are like some of my favorite creators are watching the show and it's just like that's insane you know you know what is annoying when you said like everyone that's come on the show is a fan already i was like you know what i can use that i can search for it and i was like oh fuck! everyone is a fan of the show that's so <laughs> annoying that's not limited it down to anyone i mean they could be lying i don't know they could be just saying i love the show and they don't even know what show they're on or whatever you know but uh no for the most part people are really really lovely and uh, and and have been so supportive and nice and we're just glad that people like the show you know <laughs> didn't you get an audition for this because you went to a, a cheese and wine night is that how this started yeah I, well yeah it was funny because i i was uh, uh my friend mimi was in town and she invited me to a wine and cheese night with her brother and, her, and mimi's husband and her baby and at the wine and cheese night, i was supposed to be like family and some friends and there was this young lady that I never met before, Yvonne. And uh, the next day she texted me, she got my number from Mimi and said, hey, I think you should audition for my fiance's new show. And I was like, when in Hollywood, you know, <laughs> just like, that's just such a Hollywood story. And I, I was like, sure, I'll buy it. And uh, as luck would have it, it was for this project. They had cast everyone. Everyone was already cast, Natasha, Kayvon, Matt, 
Mark, everyone was cast except for Guillermo. They had a, they had a hard time finding Guillermo. And there was people who were testing, but they had voted like 40-60, uh, 50-50. The, no one was like voting unanimously on somebody. So I went in, the character was 20 years older than I am. So it wasn't even right, but I like try to make my best. So I was at my writing partner, Jamie's house and she had a poster with Guillermo de Toro's picture of his monster books. And I was like, that's, that's a good look for a Guillermo. And so I parted my hair in the middle and I curled it to the side and I got these glasses, Harry Potter glasses, and I popped them out to look like Guillermo's glasses. And I based my physical appearance based on what I saw as Guillermo on the back of a poster. And, um, and yeah, and then I, I, I booked it and it was the first time they voted unanimously for someone to test and I never tested. Uh, the week of Martin Luther King weekend, in fact, the six year anniversary was last week or two weeks ago. Uh, I think it was two weeks ago of me auditioning for Shadows um, because, uh, or me getting the part for Shadows because it was over MLK weekend on a Sunday. I got the call from Taika and Jermaine and they're like, hey, is this Javi? And I was like, yeah, I was like, hey, it's uh, Taika and Jermaine. And he was like, oh, hi. He's like, you auditioned for us. I was like, yeah, thank you so much. And so like, um, it's like, yeah, you're not going to test. And I was like, oh, thank you for the opportunity. I wish you all the best. I thought it was like giving me like a call to let you know. So sometimes they do that. They're like, sorry, it's not going to go your way. And they said, no, you're the mate. We'll see you on set. And I was like, I had to call my agents for the first time in history and tell them that I booked something. And they're like, no, you're testing for this. We just don't know when. And like production starts. So that was a Sunday. Monday was Martin Luther King Day. Tuesday was a fitting. And Wednesday I was on set. I mean, you must have been a fan of the film beforehand. I had never seen it. I had never seen the film. Had you not? No, because it was on my queue to watch that same night when I left Wine and Cheese Night. And I literally was like, should I stay in and watch? It was on queue on Amazon. And I was like, should I stay and watch? Everyone's been telling me about this. Everyone keeps telling me about this movie. Everyone keeps telling me about this movie. I didn't watch it. And I'm glad I didn't. Because after going to the meeting and after, or the, or the uh, Wine and Cheese Night, and then getting the meeting, I still didn't watch it because I didn't want to be influenced by it. Because I was like, no, don't do it. Don't do it. Because if you get the character, you're getting it already naturally. But don't get, you know, fogged up with something else. And I'm glad I didn't. After I got the part, I saw the movie. And I'm glad I didn't watch it because I was like, no, I would have totally been influenced. And I would totally would have tried to, you know, uh, cater or mimic Jackie's uh, performance as the familiar. And who's amazing, but that's not who Guillermo is. Guillermo's a different person, you know? And Jackie's performance is brilliant as, you know, as her character. So I'm glad that I didn't watch it until afterwards. And it's a great film. It still holds up, you know? <laughs> Genuinely blow my little, how did, how did Tyker and Jermaine react when you said, by the way, never seen it? Well, it's funny. Cause at one point when I auditioned, I sent my tape and when I went to the casting office and they sent the tape, uh, because of the, the uh, Yvonne, the girl that I met at the wine and cheese, she told me later that even her boyfriend, who at the time or fiance at the time, Gary Bash, um, even asked her, "Did you did you coach him?" And it's like, "What? No." It's like, "Did you coach him?" Because it's he's so good as Guillermo that they thought that she had like taken me aside and be like, "Hey, I'm gonna tell you what they're looking for. They're looking for this." Blah, blah, blah. She never did that. She never even told me anything. She just said you should audition for this show. And I guess the audition was too uncanny to what they wanted and too real. And then, uh, um, what's it called? Taika and Jermaine had literally asked, did he get coached on this? Like, did he get coached to do this? Uh, no one coached me. It was just like, and I'm glad that I didn't see the movie because then see it would have totally made everything different. So it's all kismet. Everything happens the way it's supposed to. Well, we've only got time for a couple more questions. And, you know, we've spoken about you playing a talking dog. We've spoken about you playing a vampire body card. But now I want to talk about you being my little DC king in Blue Beetle. <laughs> oh, my God. Dude, I'm so excited. For, as you said, you're just taking on roles that you've never done before. Now you're going to be in a superhero film. I mean, you must be so proud to be a part of this because isn't this like the first Latino superhero yeah. with this huge Latino cast? How did you react when you found out you're going to be a part of this? I I was just, I just, I, I wanted to be a part of this so bad. And I remember having a producer session and director session. Uh, and it was during the time that I was promoting Reacher, which is a show that I did for Amazon. So it was the same day I was doing press. So in between interviews at a press junket, I would go and meet with the directors through Zoom. And then I go do interviews and I would come back and do the lines again. And they get notes and I come back and have to record myself. They have one more last thing they wanted to see. And so in between promoting like one project, I was running to my hotel room, putting on tape, using the lamp as like my light, putting it towards the window to get like, like I wanted to do it so bad. And then when I got it, I was like, wow, it's again, like making history. It's the first 
you know, Mexican superhero. Um, and then to be a part of it, the whole cast is Latino and the writer and the the director, Angel Soto is an amazing director. Um, it's just reading the script was so, in a weird way, like cathartic, just because it was just like, it reminded me of like nostalgia, like my childhood, like it was like the language, the verbiage was being like said, I was like, this is crazy. This is like my childhood. Like, this is how I talked to my mom and my household. And at dinner, this is how we say, and this is how we joke with each other. And the cool thing is that if you grew up in that household, it, you'll, it, you'll be able to relate to it. And if you didn't, you're still introduced and welcome to it. So it's kind of cool because you don't have to be of Latino descent to enjoy the film. You're going to enjoy it because it's going to take you and introduce you into a world and culture that you might have not been aware of, or you might be aware of, you know, it might be, be like, hey, that's kind of like how my best friend's family is, or that's kind of, you know, so it's really wonderful. And I can't wait for everyone to see it because it's going to be so good. I'm so excited for it. I'm genuinely so excited for this film. And, you know, earlier I tried asking you about what we do in the Shadows upcoming season. And very cleverly, you said, I can't tell you anything. So I'm not going to ask you who you play in Blue Beetle. I feel like that'd be stupid. <laughs> so I'm going to ask you, now that you've played Nightwing in Harley Quinn, another DC character, how does your character in Blue Beetle differ from Nightwing? Well, I think for Nightwing, obviously, uh, different approach, different. Uh, Nightwing is brooding and um, and has a lot of uh, things that he's dealing with. And so does the character in Blue Beetle, but in, for different reasons. Um, I just think, um, yeah, they're just two different. Two, I see what you're doing here. I see what you're to do. <laughs> I'm not as dumb as I look, am I? And I see what you're trying to do and you're being very clever and wanting me to talk about the Blue Beetle character by comparing it to the other DC character. Um, but I will say they're just too different and they're too different and they do have two different backstories, obviously. And uh, they both have goals and they both have dreams and they both, um, you know, uh, have to go through hurdles to, to kind of make uh, things happen. That's all I'm going to say. And that's the... <laughs> You know what? I know exactly who, who you're playing from that description. It's so obvious. <laughs> I mean, the thing is, like, you know, that'd be kind of cool to, in a world where, like, you know, Chola plays Blue Beetle, obviously, in the movie. Um, and then playing, you know, Nightwing has been so great. I was at a restaurant the other night, the night that we got the nomination for Oscar, we went to celebrate. And uh, one of the busters was walking by and walked really fast and just by my ear. And it was like, <laughs> I love you, it's Nightwing. You know, it's just like whispered it as he like picked up a plate and like left the table. And I was like, oh, thank, thank you. Like, it was just like, he was like, he couldn't stop, I guess. He would have gotten in trouble or something. But like, he just like, it was a drive-by compliment whisper. And it was just like, I love you, Sideway. You know, it just like, he kept going. And I was like, thank, thank you so much. And it's like, uh, so it's kind of funny because usually when you do voiceover, you don't really know who's doing that voice unless you go look them up. So the fact that I was at a restaurant, you know, it's crowded and stuff, and you say, that's the guy who does Nightwing, is, but not like anything else. Not the guy from Shadows, because clearly you can see my face in Shadows, but it's like, it's always a little bit more surprising when I hear someone point out a, a voice character that I do, because you're like, wow, you have to go find out who I was. Like, you have to go and Google who does the voice of this character. And remember it too, because you could forget it. and be like, oh, who cares? He lives in the animation world, you know? So it's very nice. So it's very nice to, to see that people, um, you know, show how much it, something means to them. Well, on that note, I mean, I love you as Parito. <laughs> Thank you so much for chatting to me. I'm so excited to to see you at the Oscars. Just to let you know, I watch it religiously. Like that is my my the best day of my year. So don't be slagging me off on the red carpet or anything because I will see it. Just to let you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I know, I won't. I, I'll just, yeah, I'll send a message from your uncle on the red carpet. <laughs> I'm wishing you so much luck at the Oscars. I'm keeping everything crossed. I can't wait for you, bud. Thank you so much. It's been great. Thanks so much. I just can't wait to go to Disneyland with you. Yeah. <laughs> and came on if I came on too. <laughs> it's a verbal contract. You can't back out now. I will soon. <laughs>